mechanical manipulation of atoms or molecules to perform some kind of a process or to assemble into something or to become something that it is not currently now. Wow. Otherwise said, little machines? A little machine is one of many implementations. Let me give you an example. In the previous, before the break, we had talked about how fast can we make a, a processor device. Correct. My answer was, well, if we could go to superconductivity, all of a sudden you've just bought yourself an order of magnitude, or better. The problem is, how do you make superconductive semiconductor? Sounds like a mouthful, but that's what it means. Well, by current day solution-based chemistry standards, you're not going to. Now, the most recent discoveries, uh, and they were kind of almost like alchemy, in the sense there was something that asked them to say, and I, and I don't want to detract from Dr. Chu and or Stansford of Shensi and the others who had theorized about these uh, non-crystalline semiconductor materials that could be superconducting. So that's a whole long story in itself, but it's kind of a strange and meandering path where finally it sort of worked, but it wasn't exactly the direct result of What it. sort of worked? Okay. Stanford of Shensi, many years ago, this goes back to early 70s, talked about something called the glass diode. It was an organic substrate that could have super, I'm sorry, semiconductor properties. And everybody laughed and thought he was wrong, and he was rejected very soundly by the government. He tried to get funding from DOE. They would listen to him. He went to Monsanto, et cetera. They wouldn't listen to him. Ended up in Japan. This year, by the way, uh, I forget the, the company, but it's in Japan. They're going online with a, it's like a paint almost. You can spray it or paint it onto any surface. Or using mylar, for instance, it rolls up like like uh, like like saran wrap or something. You can put this material on any surface, and it acts like a very effective solar collector. Very inexpensive, less than a tenth of the cost of its silicon counterparts. You paint on a solar collector? In a sense, yes. In other words, you, you buy the material prefabricated. It comes in a roll, but it's, it's a gel-like material that's simply applied to a surface, and it, and it is in a sense a fluid before it's applied. Now he proved that a non-crystal material could behave like a semiconductor. From that sort of first step, it was also theorized that perhaps there could be non-crystal superconductors. And this is where Dr. Chu's work over here at Stanford came in. And now there's a whole class of rare earth doge ceramics that <laughs> are non-crystal substrates. They contain uh, little nanocrystals, if you will, that interconnect to each other, but it's still residing in a non-crystalline substrate, and yet... There's you are so far out from me. I'm losing this. Oh, what is it you're saying this is? What I'm saying is that using nanotechnology, one can invent a material yes. to respond to an engineering requirement. And I'll give you an example. There's a new class of material called fullerenes. Fullerenes are cages of carbon. They look like little balls, little soccer balls, let's say, although they come in tubes now and other configurations mm -hmm. and so on. Uh, it was invented by Dr. Smalley at Rice University, but now there's a whole bunch of companies actually producing these as a commercial product. Why would you want to do this? Because once you have these little cages of carbon, you can then put elements and or molecules or other materials inside the cages of carbon, cages. and then you can bind these cages together yeah. and invent a new matrix of material that would never form under natural conditions, or with traditional solutions. Which would, which would do, for example, what? Well, I want to fabricate a superconductor that can operate at the temperature range of my choosing. Uh -huh. And this is one really, really narrow example. So think of just what that alone does. And people are trying to solve this problem now. I'll offer an example, for instance. There is a company called Mitra. They're huge. They're all over the world. They've got... 40,000 employees, roughly, and they have labs in different countries as well as here. Most of their budget, by the way, is black, i.e., what e-systems it's computing. These guys are to physics and specialized materials and all that kind of stuff. Yes. But they've got a very big chunk of their budget in nanotech. I don't even know myself how much there is. I mean, I have friends, but there's only so much I can learn about this. What are they trying to do? Well, I, I have no doubt molecular computing is big on their list, but specialized materials in general. And... I want to jump ahead just a little bit because see, we talked just earlier about the idea that if we suddenly get off this planetary surface, we're going to be in somebody else's backyard. Maybe I don't like that so much, and that's why they're dropping the visitors now. 
Well, the nanotech realm is what facilitates that. Why? Because there's a whole plethora of physicists and theoreticians out there who've come up with some very nice, very doable, in my belief, models, mathematical models, of how to contrive our gravity well or how to do a time-space manipulation. That, in a sense, how, wait, wait, wait. How to contrive a gravity well? Yes. Or how, or how to... What, 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 what is a gravity well? Oh, okay. All objects have a gravitational force surrounding them. That's the core of that... Uh, there's an event horizon that says when you come to within a certain proximity, right. suddenly you're going to engage yourself in the gravitational pull of that... The event horizon of a black hole. <laughs> yes, but all things have, a, have an event horizon. Correct. Uh, the point being that if you could contrive that as an event, it would, in a sense, allow you to neutralize the gravitational field around you. Oh. You could float. In other words, it's, a, it's, it's one of several different implementations of an anti-gravity device. And lots of folks have been talking about this. And supposedly these guys in Finland claim they have done it. But they're, no. they're talking about creating an uh, artificial event horizon? Is in that, a sense, that? yes. And, and, but the, the point I'm trying to get at is, it's mostly theory now. I don't know if the folks in Finland really did this or not. But it's kind of a mystery. But the point is, I've talked to lots of people that have, you know, just very elaborately worked out theories. If only we could have the materials by which to construct the device that would have the energy densities required to make this thing happen. With nanotechnology, see, in today's world, engineering is confined to the materials and manufacturing processes currently available. In the nano world, you invert that process. Mm -hmm. You construct the molecules and or the materials with the properties to suit the design. The design drives the material, not the other way around. Mm -hmm. Therefore, so, I mean, chemical-based rockets and all that kind of stuff, totally ridiculous. That, that's like trying to, you know, walk across the continent or something. It's just not it's absolutely impractical. Blunderbuss. Blunderbuss. Mm -hmm. The minute you cross into the gravity realm, suddenly... It's wide open. You can go almost anywhere and do what you want, because I think that the laws of physics are much more flexible. I don't want to get into like, hyperdimensional physics and all that. Okay, does this, field, does this mean uh, you're talking about molecular manipulation? Yes. Correct. When you can begin to do that, you can then create... The material of choice. You specify. Imagine this. Now, here we're going to go ahead a, a, a couple of decades. I'm in an engineering lab. Instead of pulling up my AutoCAD three-dimensional drawing of some machine I'm trying to con contrive, uh -huh. I fetch up a series of equations that represent some kind of a property that I wish I could invent a material to match. Yes. Then the sentience engine, which is vastly smarter than we are right now, sort of anticipates this and says, okay, here's 10 or 12 nano options. Try this. And the nano assembler skews it out for me as an ingot or a sample to oh, like oh, oh, my design. That's what's around the point. That's why there'd be folks out there looking at us now saying, well, we're getting kind of close. We want to have a second look. Now, this is one slice of a big pie. But how far from that to these sentient, sentient beings you're talking about uh, deciding on their own to create? Well, this, you, this, is, to, this is where it gets fuzzy. I know what you're getting at. <laughs> I understand completely. And my friend, Dr. Davis, always said, we well, can just pull out the plug. Well, eventually, there will be no single plug to pull out, and I know this. That's and I, I saw the Forbin Project when I was quite young. And I, it was actually filmed right here at Berkeley, up at the uh, science, uh, Hall of Science. <laughs> I had a personal connection to the whole thing. But the point I'm trying to get at is these are different types of implementations coming from the same common strata. They don't have to go that way, but yes, there is that potential. Well, I think we're actually already past the plug-pulling point with the Internet. We're way past Oh, yeah. No, I, I, I completely understand what you're saying. What I'm trying to get across here, though, is as follows. The reason I was so bent on socioeconomic systems and the economies of the near future and the revaluation away from hard assets to virtual assets and all that stuff is because when you have this kind of a functionality being brought online and accessible to a general audience, or supposedly so, how do you establish the valuation of commodities and goods? In a sense, the software is the thing that has the value. The stuff that it creates is valueless. A, a, a very kind of clunky analogy would be if all the diamonds that exist in the world are suddenly dumped into the marketplace, the diamonds would have the value of beach stone. I mean, this is That's right. Out. Okay, so you apply the sort of nano domain to that same logic form. Well, gee whiz, folks, guess what? So in this short-term interim sort of this, this chaos manifold that we're about to be thrust through, something's going to have to be sorted out where 
a new, a whole new paradigm of valuation system has to be established to determine what has value and by what new methodologies of measure can different kinds of business entities and socioeconomic systems can be established. We don't know that yet. This is where I see the failure point. It's not so much will the thinking machine run amok or will we spot you want to hear something else far out? I mean I've only given you a couple of examples. Go ahead. Try this one. A quasi viral component. A quasi what the a hell? A quasi viral what the hell is that? <laughs> okay, here's an answer. Think just for a minute. This is a very simple explanation. I'm, skipping, I'm not a biophysicist. I'm skipping a lot of detail. But the general idea is as follows. What a virus does is it has a chemical and also topographical feature set externally that is designed to mate to a specific kind of protein. That's right. Most cells have a unique protein wall that surrounds them, like, like a little, like a prophylactic of sorts, it has its own particular unique topology. That's right. When the virus happens to run into the cell that it's designed to mate with, it bonds. I mean, it physically, like hand to a glove, gloms itself on there. Yep. Through enzymic action, it tears through the cell wall. AIDS, the, AIDS virus is a good right, example. Exactly. goes to the cytoplasm, finds those ribosomes, and what the ribosomes do is they, they're like the, the chemical foundry for the cell. They spit out more RNA, and they sort of maintain a metabolistic process engine of sorts. And in fact, most of all diseases, including aging itself, is the result of those metabolisms failing for some reason. They, they cannot supply some missing ingredient as part of the chemical stew that keeps that cell functioning. So then, for example, you might suggest nanotechnology right. developed eventually could reverse or stop the aging process. That is exactly what I'm saying. And talk about a socio-political, philosophical, spiritual dilemma. How do you solve for X on that one? And even if you were not to get that far, even if you were just to say, okay, all known diseases go away, because now if you can target a cell, you see, the first half of the process is wonderful. It's a precise mechanism for delivering something to a cell that can go inside of it and then manipulate its internal chemistry. It's only the second half where the ribosome is forced to create more viral components at the expense of the host cell that all bets are off and the organism dies eventually. Fine. Well, there are those biophysicists out there who look at a virus as like a machine component of sorts, and if one were to go as mm -hmm. far as being able to engineer viral-like devices, which can perform the essential equivalent of intracellular corrective chemistry, mm -hmm. yes, that's a lock and a key. But, but, as I said earlier, Every new run on this ladder carries with it a magnified, a larger risk versus gain ratio volume, you might say. In this particular example, if we got this far, we could either buy life and happiness or eradicate life as we know it to be. Why? Viruses tend to be kind of fragile. They mutate rather readily. They mutate extremely often, as a matter of fact. Mutational uh, velocity is the inverse of organism complexity. Therefore, since the virus is the simplest thing that exists really in terms of its total molecular structure and so on, it's the thing that will be like most xenomorphic in its activities, how it interprets its surrounding environment. And if we hatch a plethora of these things, and a couple of them get out of hand, that would, that's all it would take. That's all it would take. It would, you know, we might as well scour the surface clean and start over. You know, we're back at ground zero. So these are the kinds of pathways that I believe other worlds have stumbled into the wrong fork, <laughs> the decision tree, if you will. Know. You know, they get to node number such and such, and they pick the wrong node. Well, okay. We are nothing more than an experiment. We are nothing more than a bunch of protein molecules that got together and after billions of years got this far. You're making us sound very tenuous, actually. Well, I think statistically, I'm kind of a, you know, I, 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 I'm a nuts and bolts guy. I mean, I'm an engineer by trade, really, from beginning square one. So I like to look at the pragmatic aspects of you know, what's the statistics involved, will the machine survive under these trauma-induced conditions, and so on, I would submit to you, just as a guess, that statistically there is a rising rate of no return. In other words, you start off with, with an aggregate sea of organisms out there in the known universe, some percentage gets to an intelligence threshold of X, some subset of that gets to the next level up, if you follow my drift, and then a much smaller subset gets to the next level up than that, and by the time you get to that sort of ultimate upper level, we're talking about a very small percentage, you know, a half a percent or a tenth of a percent. I'm just guessing. I just had this graph in my mind.